in this particular episode, we're going to be focusing on the starter application that actually comes up when we actually bootstrap our Flutter application. Remember in episode one, after we did the SDK installations, we, we did Flutter Create to actually test that our installations work correctly, right? So uh, in this episode, we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to create a new Flutter application and then we're going to work through the code because we've not actually seen the code since we actually started this series. So in this particular episode, we're going to be taking a look at the code, what was generated for us after running that Flutter command. And then we're going to actually uh, dissect those codes and see how what actually uh, makes up those applications that we're going to be actually running on the screen today. So let's quickly jump into terminal. Uh, in the terminal, just uh, uh, navigate into the workspace that you actually normally use. So uh, I just want to use the terminal in this case. Uh, sometimes it actually comes very handy. But as time goes on in the series, we're going to be using manual approach, probably just navigating or using our Android Studios or uh, IDs to actually create the flood application. So let's go ahead and do, I'm going to navigate into, uh, into where I want to actually use um, So live inside the directory, I want to create this. I'm going to then run Flutter Create. All right. So make sure you're actually in the right folder you want to uh, organize your project, right? So before you run the commands, I'm going to do Flutter Create. Remember, if you did not do the installation in episode one, where we did the Flutter SDK installation and setting the path variable, you will not be able to execute Flutter command in any of those directories. Because what we did after setting the path variable is that we made it possible for Flutter to be executed in any directory in our computer, right? So that was what we did in that particular episode. So if you don't have an experience of not actually watch the video, or you already don't have Flutter installed in your, you know, in your machine, then the link to that particular episode is actually in the description. So it's actually going to be nice if you go back to it and um, watch it so you can actually follow along. So Flutter creates the command. And then the next thing is the app name or whatever name you want to give it. So I'm going to give it uh, first app. Oh, sorry. Just call it starter, starter underscore app. So once you do that, you can actually hit um, enter and it's, it's going to spin up the process of trying to create that. You can see it has happened, wrote 127 files, all done. In order to run your application, we need to CD into that particular folder. So I'm going to do CD starter and actually i'm in that particular folder right now so the next thing i need to do is to open this particular folder in the code editor so i'm going to do code and let's see if that opens that for us so you can see that i'm actually right now in the starter app project and let's take a look at what was generated so um if you bootstrap a new Flutter application, it comes in because you know Flutter is a multi-platform uh, application framework, all right? So it helps you to actually develop Android, iOS, and um, even Windows and desktops, Windows, Mac, and everything in between, and the web, all right? So if you look at this, you can see that we have iOS, Android, the lib is where we organize our codes. Then you can see we have Linux specific, Mac OS specifics, and you also see web, right? These are where it bundles specific uh, platform uh, related instructions for actually building for such platforms. But basically your code is going to be living inside this very place, right? So, uh, but as time goes on, let's just take this uh, bit by bit. So the Android folder is actually what where you do your Android specific things. The reason for this is because uh, Flutter is just going to be a breed that helps you to actually build more platform uh, UI, all right. So your your UI is going to work on every platform. But if you want to do specific things, uh, right, that concerns a specific machine, let's say you want to do Android specific things, like things that pertain to maybe checking the uh, battery life of an Android device and stuff, uh, you may not be able to do that on the surface of the lead folders, probably because it's actually specific to Android. So at that point now, the idea of having an experience in the native code becomes very helpful. So if you're actually coming from the native Android platform or development environment or ecosystem, this is where it's going to be very useful to you, right? So, and if you are familiar with Android, you already know that your structure of an Android project is always app, Gradle and all of that. So you can see we have a Gradle, build a Gradle here. 
this is where you actually organize your dependencies. We have two types of build on Gradle. We have the module level build on Gradle. This is where you put your dependencies repository. Um, if you want to pull a particular dependency, you might have to register that the class path here and uh, the type of repository. Sometimes it's actually Google or Maven, right? So, but when you now document your your dependencies, you go to the app level build.gradle. You can see that there's another build.gradle. This is the project level build.gradle, and this is the app level build.gradle. So if you open this one, you can see there's a lot of things configured in the groovy language style. And this is where you actually put up your dependencies. Let's say we want to bring in something like a, a card view that is specific to Android or whatever other dependencies. We want to probably manipulate uh, JSON, all right. You want to manipulate probably like Firebase and whatever other specific uh, Android dependencies you want to put. This is where you register them. If they are not Flutter specific dependencies, if these are things that actually need to interact with native codes, this is where you register them. You can see that what we have here is a different type of, but you don't need to worry about this. If you actually come in uh, as a new person in Flutter, this is not really something to worry about because most of the time you don't really need to touch this. These are just like uh, configurations that automatically generated for you in the uh, Flutter Android friendly way, all right? Because if you're actually building a native Android, you wouldn't see such of these. You're not going to see like Flutter version code and all of that. This is just the way Flutter migrate the version you have your popspec.yaml. If you go to the popspec.yaml, there are versions here and how do Android interact with each other to actually know what version. An example is this. If I build an application that is on 1.0, let me give you an instance. If I have 1.0.0 plus, and uh, it's actually, I, I'm actually trying to deploy the Android version. And then you have to wonder how, when you generate your APK, how do Android really know the version? Because this is where you made your setups. So these are now where the communication now happens. All right. So there's an in, there's a communication between this particular file to so the, the Gradle file has to be able to pick up these information and be able to actually track that versioning. All right. So this is something you don't need to worry about because it's already been handled. Most of the time where your work or your eye is going to be is on your dependencies and probably the release versions, depending on if you are doing a config, uh, you are doing a debug release or actually a release that's probably officials. So you can see that we have conf uh, debug release here, but this is just going to be an advanced stuff. We're going to talk about that later. So most of this part of this file is not something you need to worry about. So I'm just going to quickly jump off this one and let's get into the iOS part. So the iOS part is more of like when you want to target the iOS, you want to target iPhone or tablet. So this is where your app code is going to live. It's going to live in the runner. The runner has this app delegate. This is just the entry point to your project for this particular Flutter application. So when you run this application iOS, this is what is actually most of the time going to be executed on the platform. And that's what we have on that particular part. I'm going to walk you through deeper into this when we start touching stuff that relates to that. This is info the info list is more of like your your manifest in Android. So it's where you register information that relates to a particular application. So we're going to get into that later, but uh, let me just walk you through the proper Flutter uh, folder right now. So we're going to do that next. So um, let's quickly go through the main of that, you know, we've not put to actually go through other places. So let's quickly just go through this one. So. Uh, in the main of that, this is the entry point to our application. So if you're actually on Flutter, this is where you'll be doing most of your work or you'll be interacting mostly with the DAT code, right? Uh, that is the language that we actually use to build Flutter apps. All right. So i um, just going to walk you through the most important part of this, which if you actually go on interview, you might actually encounter them. And that's why I want to focus on that part. All right. So quickly, I'm going to look at this very first code that you see most of the time. So once you launch a new Flutter project on the main that you're always going to see this guy is going to be on top. 
um, you can see the main and you can see the run app. So the main, the main method is actually the method that, that is purely uh, that code, right? Is a that function at this point, all right? That takes our Flutter widget, our Flutter app, all right? So we are bundling our Flutter app, the widgets, the UIs, and then we are plugging it into the run app. The run app is now called in the main method because the main method is the entry point to our application. So we need that main method to be able to uh, kind of um, to run our app when it starts. So once your app starts, all right, is this guy that is being getting called. And once it's called, it calls its run app function. The run app function is what takes our Flutter app application now, the UI that we've actually built which must start from a particular entry point. So if you go to, if you look at my app, you can see the definition of my app here. My app was called here because it's a, it's a class, it's a new instance. A new instance of this class was now created here. You understand? And then it has this name. You can give it any name. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> then, uh, then it has some kind of overrides and stuff. If you are used to um, anything, close to Java, C++ or C Sharp, you, you probably might have seen this kind of similarities. You know, it's called object-oriented programming where you have uh, child classes or subclasses inheriting from their parents, right? So that's exactly what happened here. So we created a new class called my app and we want some functionalities in the parent class called stateless widget, which is why we are calling super.key here because it means that there's a, there's a key uh, feature or a key field in the super class, which is the stateless widget, all right? So that's why if you're wondering what this is, because in a long, in a long, along the line, you're going to be seeing it appears most of the time in our project, all right? And uh, another thing you can also see this quickly curly braces. This is kind of named parameter. In other pro programming languages, you might actually see them, but in that, it's always very useful because it kind of gives you the ability to differentiate between, uh, you know, just normal parameters or named ones, so that you can clearly uh, give the person that is going to call the function ability to understand and know exactly the type of value they should pass. So the next thing I want to explain is this material app. Every Flutter application must have a material app, right? That is actually the app that you are trying to run here. So when you do run app, it's expecting this material app. So if I hover on material app, just to give you a context. You know, it says create a material app, at least one of home routes or general route must not be null. If only it is given, it must include an entry, uh, an entry for the navigator dot default route name. That is the fourth slash, that is the home, the roots. All right. So this uh, material app must have, must, ha must be in the particular any application you are building. All right. Because it's going to define the the entry point where the app starts. Let me give you an example. If you have an app you're building, let's say um, a gaming application, right? But before the user gets into probably uh, start playing the game, you want to walk the user through what you have in the app. Let's say in this app, you're going to be able to play awesome games. You want to go ahead and share the kind of weapons that are in the game so that the user gets excited before he gets into the app, right? So it's actually, at this point, you can structure how those gonna okay. If you want to show this kind of walkthroughs in the app, then you need to probably create an entry point where these people are gonna be able to see um or start trying to swipe to see these features, all right. So the entry point must be there. So, and how do you put that entry point? It must be in the home. So every material app must have a home or a route. The route is like where you there's a direction you give it. There's, if I point to this again, you're going to see there's a route, ungenerate route. And if you are using the ungenerate route method, then you're going to make a definition of all the routes in the application, right? And then you must also provide the forward slash, that is the root. 
so that the ungenerate routes will pick up the route from that particular stop and then you might not need to really uh, distinguish this home here all right you will define that home route inside the ungenerate route and then you should be able to the ungenerate route should be able to find that and force the user to first see that application first all right so that being said you're going to understand this as we go ahead if you are just very new but if you already used to flutter you already then it's not going to uh, be so surprising another important thing i want to point out is uh, uh, the power of op and you know being able to provide these informations if you look at here we have my home page so my home page is also a new definition of a class but you can see that this time around it's not the it's not extending the stateless widgets, it's extending the stateful widget. Uh, these are part of things we're going to be explaining later. The difference between this and when to use what. Well, automatically, you can see that here in this new uh, type of widget, you are providing value right here, right? It's not. It doesn't mean that you cannot actually provide value dynamically in a stateless widget. You, you can definitely provide that. But down the line, you can see that the type of class we have here is a little different. The class we have in this place, there's no other class that probably holds state. But you can see here, we have this definition on my homepage, which is of, of stateful widget. And then it has an override, all right? This other one doesn't have, it doesn't have a state override, but it has just a build override. And, and I need you to understand, probably if you're just a new person in OOP, you must have, if you've not heard about overrides, it's, it's kind of a way to tell, see, um, I have, this is a house, I have a house, all right, and I have a refrigerator inside. But somebody wants to create a new refrigerator, all right, you need, but you're borrowing from the other refrigerator, so, and you want to give it the same name, all right, so you're trying to tell the parent, please, I want to define, I want to create a new refrigerator. In this new house right so but i need to uh, specify that this is like kind of a copy of the old ref refrigerator but it's going to probably have uh different designs inside maybe a different compartment but it's probably just going to have the same name. let's say uh, i want to borrow from panasonic right panasonic i'm just going to clone your your outer surface right yeah but what I'm going to be putting inside, how the inside is going to be, it's going to be different. All right. But some of the features you have, like maybe your logo and all of that, I'm still going to retain them. I don't know. Just the simple way I think I can explain that. So if you check out here, we have my, my homepage, which is what we gave it. And then we are borrowing this guy. You then you can see the other things we did not create by ourselves that was automatically created for us was the state. The state is there it must be there it's actually what holds uh the dynamics or all the things that change in, in our application if you if you point you can say state is the information that can read synchronous when the widget is built and two might change during the lifetime of the widget the widget is everything that has to do with our ui so the state is something that might change or might not change at the point of the rebuilds right the rebuild could be when you click a button, do you want something to happen? Do you want something to change? Or when you receive data from the API, do you want something to update and all of that? So these are like possible states. Now you can see that this create state, we are not the one that did this. The create state was inherited, all right? It was inherited because it came from the parent because we are inheriting from this stateful widget, all right? So it's an override method. Just this could be just the Panasonic label that I'm talking about. We don't want to change this, but what we're changing now is this guy. This guy is my homepage state, which is this new class. It's a private class. So essentially, what we're doing is in, in this particular class is we're actually pulling a new state, a new class that is also a state class, and we're returning it when this guy is referenced. You will see that 90% of it, 99.99%, you're never going to actually reference this guy. All right. But this guy is inside this particular homepage class. So even though we're going to do some of our stuffs here, the UI and some state manipulations, but we are always going to call here. So if you see when we call this place, it's going to plug in the guy here and then we're providing this title. Then you'll be wondering, how do we now bring this guy here? It's because this class has been called here. This guy is returning the create states returns my homepage state 
and my homepage state extend state now. All right, not instead of state widget, it extend the pure state, and then with the type of my homepage. So this is where we can now do whatever that has to do with uh, manipulating changes and state itself. So I don't want to waste too much time on this one. I'm just going to quickly walk through this because this is just uh, a startup project, and that's what you see most of the time when you start an application. Uh, on Flutter, so you can see that we have set state here. So I'm going to quickly just go ahead and start the application and see if we can run it. Right now, I'm already in the root of the project, and we've been able to run Flutter create, and our Flutter has created. I have my emulator up, all right. So if you don't have your emulator, so let probably just this is what you should do. Just do open dash a simulator here that's going to help you to create to open up the simulator actually do the running so i'm just going to do this run and it's going to start running now so uh make sure you have maybe your okay you can see right now that i need some kind of accesses so if you don't have that up if you if you also need to resolve some stuff on on the, on the internet, then you probably need to give it access to issue. Then you should enable your internet and make sure you're connected. And with that, you should be able to get your stuff running. So while I wait, let me just explain the last part of this. So if you check out here, we have a class. You have a a, an, a a final variable. Sorry, not a final, but is a private variable counter with an initial value of zero. And then we have this function that increments the value of this guy. So what happens is that it sets set state is actually what changes the state of anything that is in our app when we're actually building a smaller application. All right, because if your application grows very big, you cannot really handle states. You just set state because the set state can only set state in this particular screen. All right. If you have an application where you need to share your state from one screen to the other, or you want this, the, uh, the state to be accessible in different places, then it's going to be difficult. Let's say you want to set uh, an example is authentication state. If someone is authenticated in your app and you want to be able to check if this guy is authenticated before, you should probably give him a particular service. It's quite difficult for you to handle such situations with such state because uh, set state only happens with what is in this particular widget or screen so it's going to be difficult so as we progress we're going to be touching other type of state management systems like providers river pod block so if you're just new in the channel make sure you subscribe because there's just going to be a lot of things and what we'll be doing is going to be the next series of video we're going to be releasing is going to be more of like full-fledged applications where we do from figma down to flutter creating everything and then you know plugging in all the all the ui as it is from the figma part and then making it work and using states uh, management anywhere that we need them all right so why this guy is okay you can see the, the app is up now and if you watch here we have i have the title fix lab here right now you can see that the state the counter is zero here all right i've not i've not clicked on this so the idea is that when this button floating action button is is unpressed when it's pressed it calls this function increment counter and what the function increment counter does is to uh check what the value of this guy is at this point of click and then increment it by one all right and that's what this guy is doing but before we continue i want to show you something in the test it's very important that you see the test part because testing your code is another good thing it's not very always everybody don't really like doing that but it's it's very important to do that so look at what we have here we have the main method as well just like we had in the home screen then we have a different thing called test widget this test widget just like uh of a function all right it's, it's not like it's from the from the flutter now or the that's main sdk right you just ignore me give it you want to test something now it takes 
Okay, it takes two parameters. All right, we want to give it a name. Okay, yeah. So this is actually a dart a, a dart testing function, right? So the test widget is from the from, is from the test uh, from the Flutter test class or package. Now it takes two variables. Uh, it takes two arguments. One is a string and one is a callback. So in the string part, we're going to define what we want to do, and then in the second parameter, we're going to pass which is a callback function. Now we're passing the widget tester now because this is a widget test. There are different three different type of tests you do on your Flutter app. We do unit testing. Unit testing is where you test more units of your functions, like your your code, just like what we had at. Uh, Let's say we want to test our um, what's it called again? There's a function that does the increment, all right? Yeah. So that is the work of a unit test. So you can unit test those functions now. But for you, why? If you want to test that this guy is available, this guy changes when you click on this button. That is a widget test, and that is what we're going to work. We're trying to work through in this very particular test, right? So widget tester is the is the uh, the object we're going to use to do the test and we're defining it as a tester here and we're going to be using it all through in the body and this is a synchronous process because we you have to wait for some time for for that to happen so we do await tester dot pump widget pump widget is, is something that comes from the tester itself and it enables us to actually render ui from a given uh widget right so what we do is that we are trying to pump widgets. We are trying to render this UI in the test path. So the testing is like you are rendering this guy in real sense. So we are plugging our application. If you remember my app, we define it in the main of that. So we are saying, tester, please go and get that app that we have defined and pump it. That is render it, create it, let it be available. And then check something for us. Check, expect to find text. Look, look for anywhere in that screen and see if you can find zero. If you find it, then find one widget. The expectation is that we're going to find one widget. All right. So you can see here, find one widget means assert that the finder locate at least an exactly one widget in this in the widget tree. So we expect to find each time we run this application, we expect to find one because at this point there's zero here. We've not touched anything. All right. Now expect to find text with one. Find nothing. There's nothing. As long as we've not tapped this button, there's no uh, widget that will have one as a value here. So that's why we expect to find nothing. Now, we're going to go ahead and tap this button. And when we type the button, how do we find the what to tap? So find by icon. So we're looking for this widget, this whole widget 3, and we're looking for anyone that has an icon add. And this is where we found it. So when we found it, we're going to say, okay, yeah, tap it. So once it taps it, then we do a with tester.pump. Remember, pop is actually what triggers the frame, like the animation. So like, you've tapped something, something you have need to happen, probably like a ripple effect to just show that you have tapped. That's the pump effect now. It's just an asynchronous way of fake asynchronous way, sort of. So once the animation has happened, we're just gonna wait for that. And then we're gonna do the next check. Find that the text with zero. There's, it doesn't exist, so we'll find nothing because at that point we've incremented our value from 0 to 1. Then expect to find one, find one widget because at that point when we click, if you did if you do a click now, you can see it has increased. So if I run this test now, I've, it's going to fail because at this point I'm only finding two and one and all of those things is not here. So if I go ahead and run this test, it's going to fail. So let's just give you a little time to set very fun. Like if you actually start out in your journey and then you test your app, it's going to be quite easy for you to you know wrap your head around it along the way so guys that's just what this particular introduction on walkthrough on the app on the startup app is so in the next video we're going to be doing real app designs and uh just get ready you know for a fun experience building applications creating applications uh we are going to learn it from the basic just so like what we did now but uh the next series video is going to actually be more of a kind of kind of advanced uh just to give you faster work through you can always come back to the basics all right uh, because i'll always be dropping some basic things like touching the smaller basic features widgets and all whatnot but i'm going to be building a real application in the, in the flow so that that's just the only thing that can make you real uh 
engineer in the field, uh, you cannot really just be able to do that just knowing only simple, simple, simple figures or, or components. So we're going to be able to combine all the nuts and bolts and be able to use them to build. So that's what we're going to be doing in the series of videos that is going to be coming. So I just wanted to prove to you that the test works, but it's going to fail because I have actually incremented the value to two. And at this point, nothing in this place will be satisfied because there's no value to in the test. So that, by the way, um, you can go ahead and do that on your own. Probably just increment the value to two and run this test by just clicking here. You don't need to change anything in the code. And then you see that it's going to fail and then see if you can copy this guy and make it two, and then run the test again and see which one works. So I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Thank you.